on my trip back home, I seem to have caught some sort of Danish infection. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to struggle through this entire episode. I do not blame the Danes. I blame the American. That's my own damn fault. Is the Danish infection going to take cause you to take a month off this summer or something? Or what, what happened? I may have to go to Costa Rica to recover. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I went to the doctor today and said, hey, I was over in Denmark. And he gave me that little kind of scared look, like the scared doctor look like, oh, really? This could be serious. <laughs> and I thought, I was in Denmark. Denmark is full of nice people. What, what could they possibly have there that could kill me? You know what I mean? It's a beautiful country. It's, I, I, yeah, we had a great time in Denmark. We had a great time in Denmark. We really did. And we saw a lot of sights. And I was very pleased that the weather was good. So uh, my kudos to everybody in Copenhagen and Denmark for throwing a great event last week. We really enjoyed it. This week in the news, a bunch of uh, interesting s stories. So the first one we're going to chat about is not too far from Denmark, actually, just to the uh, the east there in German waters. Uh, a ship carrying 1,500 tons of grain hit a wind turbine. So we're going to talk about that a little bit and try to understand how we can avoid these things in the future. Uh, and then we're going to go and talk about DNV, uh, starting up a joint industry project to look at geotechnical and design considerations for earthquake protection for offshore wind, onshore wind, um, and, and some different areas of the world. Next, we talk about uh, National Thermal Power and TPC in India building or requesting to build nine gigawatt hours worth of battery capacity and Ming Yang developing fish farms in their offshore wind jackets. And then we take a look at Naberwind, based in Spain, and some backing, the financial backing they received that's going to uh, hopefully uh, get some of their great ideas into reality. And RWE has selected Siemens Gamesa for a huge number of wind turbines. So congratulations to RWE and Siemens Gamesa. Our wind farm of the week is High Banks Wind in Kansas, so stay tuned for that. I'm Alan Hall, president of WeatherGuard Lightning Tech, and I'm here with the vice president of North American Sales for Wind Power Lab, Joel Saxon, and the CEO and founder of Intel Store, Phil Totero. And this is the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. Well, we had another ship collide with a wind turbine. A cargo ship named the Petra L collided with a wind turbine at Orsted's Gota Wind One offshore wind farm, causing a five by three meter hole in the hull and water ingress. Good times on that ship. Uh, the Antigua flag vessel was carrying 1,500 tons of grain from uh, Poland to Antwerp, and the wind farm that Gota Wind Farm is about 45 kilometers from the coast. No injuries were reported. Thank goodness. Uh, and the incident is currently under investigation by local authorities and serves as a reminder of the potential risk involved in shipping and the importance of maintaining strict safety protocols. And this obviously is not the first time that a ship has run into a wind turbine. We've all seen that video that pops up on LinkedIn every week or two from a couple of years ago. Just kind of bobbing around. Yeah. Yeah, right. No one's paying attention in Kablooey. There's a difference on this one, though. If you look at the AIS data, the ship looks like it was on a straight line for like a kilometer and then just like went dunk, like right in, like someone was asleep at the wheel or. What are, what are the, what happens on the bridge there, Joel? Does, is there, is there some sort of alarm that says, hey, wake up, there's, you're going to run into a wind turbine? You know, and, and depending on what vessel you're on, yes. But when you're on a, uh, you know, just a grain hauling, heavy haul boat, that, that vessel is probably 30, 40 years old. There's not a, usually a whole lot of advanced telemetry systems or sensors on it. It's just, boom, it hit. That's, and that's why these boat captains usually make a lot of money so they can avoid those things. Um, but yeah, I would say probably not on this one. They probably didn't know it until, uh oh, we've got water coming in. Um, and that hole was big. I don't know if anybody listening saw the pictures of it. I was thinking, how did this ship not sink? They must have some really good bilge pumps in this thing because that hole was massive. Well, what does it take to add it to an old ship? Is it just an iPad and a connection to the internet, like a Starlink? Is that what they need to prevent them from running into? When turbines and why are they not doing that? I would think that um, I mean, yeah, you can you can always add something like that r retroactively, but it's just cost, right? So if it's everything's a cost game. But I mean, um, I don't know this because I haven't been on a vessel in a wind offshore wind farm. But sometimes there's like aids to navigation on your AIS computer systems, right? So I would think that 
visually, even if you're running in high winds, bad seas and something like that on the AIS system or on your navigation computer, you would see, hey, there's wind turbines here. So someone was, uh, I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be the police here, but someone was not paying attention. Uh, that's the only way something like that happens at a vessel like that big. Yeah, the last one was uh, the ship, uh, the, the engines died on the ship, right? And it just was a drift and it ran into a foundation, right? Now, so that was about a year ago, if, if that long ago. So uh, this is a real safety issue, more than I thought it'd ever be. I think everybody kind of waved their hands and said, yeah, it's, it's never going to happen. And we've had a couple of incidences already and, we, and we're not even getting started. Yeah, Phil, you're a resident numbers guy. How, how tall is the turbine off the top of the water? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's but it, that's also not even the operative thing, right? Because if you have fog or something, then, you know, one would assume that they have to operate on instruments. And you're right that a lot of these older vessels don't necessarily have the advanced like there's no like aircraft collision avoidance or vessel collision collision avoidance type of thing that, that you have in in other industries. So. Uh, especially on an older vessel. So the the short answer to Alan's earlier question as well is why aren't people outfitting these ships with sensors is cost. As with anything on a wind turbine or solar or whatever, I mean, everybody wants CMS on their turbine, but it, they'd happily take it if it was free. But if, if there's a cost to it, then, oh, by the way, we're we're you know too tight on our budget to, to afford CMS or anything advanced. You know, and it's it's and that's what it ultimately comes down to. I wonder if this isn't going to trigger more regulatory oversight on, you know, especially throughout Europe, the UK, the US, um, Japan, you know, for them to say, you know what, look, we're going to have to mandate um, that older vessels retrofit some type of advanced navigation capability. Um, and have more up-to-date information available for, I mean, the, the go-to-wind farm, the first phase, which is the, the unit that got hit, uh, that's been there for a number of years already. So it's not like, you know, somebody's database shouldn't have been up-to-date with the turbine locations. Um, but one hopes that, you know, these new turbine sites that are being built out, and there's about to be a lot more in Germany, a lot more in, in the Netherlands, Belgium, France, uh, you know, and the UK, of course, and, you know, they're going to, this is not going to be the last of these incidents, I, I fear. So is the next step then, if the ships continue to run into turbines, which evidently they are, do the, you then put some sort of alarm system on the turbines themselves, like take the ping unit, you know, it's mounted to the turbine <laughs> tower right there and just put like a flashing light or some sort of laser beam or a flare system on it as it, it senses an approaching ship, like, hey, we're here. Don't run into us. There's got to be something we can do. Yeah, it's not a it's not a bad idea. Again, I think it'll ultimately come down to cost. I, I you know the insurance companies are the ones that are going to have to step in on that one because this this was one of these like you know act of God type of things. I, although you could argue that there's there's culpability on the the vessel operator um, and the captain, but at the end of the day, I mean you know insurance is going to have to pay for the damage on the foundation, the transition piece, you know, whatever, whatever damage there is to the turbine. I, and again, to Joel's point, I mean, that I can also not believe that ship didn't sink because that, I mean, you, you saw the video of them steaming back into the Harbor with this massive hole and you're just like, really? And they, I mean, like that, that was literally a Titanic sized hole, like, you know, in the, in the thing. And it's like, you know, watch out icebergs. Uh, here, here comes this thing. <laughs> so how does this get adjudicated? Because it's so far off the coast of Germany, does it go to some international court? Where, where does everybody sue one another at? Where does that happen at? I would assume that it's still Germany because it's there, it's international water but because the turbine connection is you know it's like it's german wind park and the the interconnections to germany they would probably claim jurisdiction i mean we have the same issue in the united states as well with you know all these wind farms in the outer continental shelf and whatnot it's you know it's beyond our u.s territorial waters but because it still falls into our jurisdiction because of you know, they, they've said that for like liability issues, the, the judge in the GE Siemens patent case even said that, you know, anything in the outer continental shelf would have, the U.S. would have patent jurisdiction out there too. 
Um, and there's precedent from oil and gas and whatnot as well. So there's, yeah, I, I think it, it'll get taken care of there. The territorial water is only like three or six miles, but the exclusive, exclusive economic zone goes like 200 for the U.S., right, on our waters. So it's different because if you go 200 miles off of Germany, you're in somewhere in the middle of Sweden. <laughs> so, that's, so that's not going to work. I was just envisioning some sort of Pirates of the Caribbean event where they just draw swords or <laughs> and just go at it like there would be an eventual winner out of that maybe faster than going through the court system honestly all right moving on from sinking ships to earthquakes dnv a global risk management and quality assurance company which we all know and love has launched a new joint industry project called ace 2 to enhance the design process for wind turbines in earthquake prone regions the ace 2 project will cover issues not addressed in the previous project which was just called ACE, <laughs> the project will focus on geotechnical aspects such as damping and liquefaction, seismic load analysis, and the specific needs of Taiwan and Japan. Good idea. Uh, the project will involve collaborative efforts by industry players, and the results will be used to update DNV's recommended practice for seismic design for wind power plants. Companies like Equinor, Orsted, Shell, and Vestas have already joined ACE, the ACE2 project, and others can apply until the end of April. So the, there is a real considerable effort to put turbines in earthquake prone regions, but there, there wasn't an industry consensus of how to do that. And this is a good step, I think, especially off the coast of California, right? California is having a lot of earthquake issues at the moment from what I hear. I assume that some of those are offshore. Um, how does this all, you, know, you would, no, you think, you think that um, as we get going, Insurance risk-wise, would you put terms out whether it's an earthquake risk, even if they get this DNB effort to work? I would off the coast of California simply because there will be no fixed bottom. It will all be floating. So the floating will be moored and in a mooring and, and anchored or, or you know, subsea micropiled solution. It, it, there's a lot of give and take. So the, 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 a chunk of earth can move 10 meters left to right. Or 10 meters north to south, you know, not north to south, but, you know, in the elevation. And on the grand scheme of things for that mooring line, it's really not going to affect it that much. Right. So, so offshore California, I think you're OK. Now, onshore California, I know a lot. There's, of course, there, we all know there's a ton of um, foundations and wind turbines there. Um, but a lot of those are outside of um fault zones i mean of course they're still going to feel it right but there's a lot of lattice tower turbines there old ones um but the majority of uh regular towered turbines there have i think bolstered larger deeper foundations just for that well the one that really uh, concerns me here or that there I'm, I'm you know the ace 2 project will cover from dnv is the stuff offshore in Taiwan and Chinese waters and Japanese waters, because liquefaction is a big problem there. I mean, you've, if you've seen the, um, there's a pictures a couple of years ago, there was a jackup barge off the coast of Taiwan installing some turbine uh, monopiles. And one of the legs on the jackup boom, hit a pocket and went down, right? So once that thing tips, the whole thing goes over uh, or close to it usually. Now, that could be a two two factored thing, right? That's you. That's not doing proper geotechnical analysis before you put that jack up there. But but the a jacket when installed offshore is just like a jack up, right? It's a foundation with four four things sitting there, and liquefaction is a is a big problem for that because I've seen it in the oil and gas world many times where you have to put mattresses and things down for stuff to sit on because the seafloor is not like the walking on the beach where it's just like this nice hard sand that you can drive a car down. Most of the time, the seafloor where these things are is very silty and very soft. And when you start to get a little bit of vibration, if you've seen liquefaction, it's super cool to look at. It's not an awesome thing if you're building near it or on top of it. Um, but it, if you look at a YouTube video of like how liquefaction works, you'll see like um, little vibrations can cause what looks to be solid ground turn into basically liquid like quicksand and that can happen sub C. So when that happens sub C, uh, if there's vibrations from an earthquake, the, where your geotechnical analysis once told you this is X, Y, and Z. Now it's ABC and some completely different. So a lag of a jacket could start to sink or move. If not, um, you know, if the geotechnical design for the basically interface between the, jacket and the seafloor wasn't done properly uh you could run into some major issues and you could have 
whole <laughs> wind farms start to tilt and move and stuff. And that's, kind of, of course, what DNV wants to avoid with this study. Yeah, if the substation tilts over, you're in big trouble, right? You, you lose the farm, essentially. Yeah. I, on the flight back from Denmark, uh, happened to watch the Godzilla movie. Right, so the so they were talking about liquefaction there. That's where I first learned about liquefaction is on an airplane from Denmark. Yeah, so the Phil, Phil, in your area, I don't know if you know this, but uh, there's a there's a bunch of MIT people out there drilling holes into the uh, uh, faults for geothermal heating. Uh, and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, fracking in the Plains area has caused earthquakes, and in, in, in also in um, Pennsylvania. Right, so they're they're really talking about using geothermal around like Nevada, California, where there's cracks in the Earth's surface uh, to pump water down there to warm up the water. Uh, and at the same time, it seems like earthquake, like you're going to trigger some earthquakes. Right? Am I wrong about that? Triggering it is one thing, but it, you also have a situation with the geothermal where if you're putting pipes, like fixed pipes, to to get your water or steam. Uh, down and then back up after it's superheated, if there's an earthquake and it shifts and bends the pipe enough and snaps the pipe, then you're, you're, you know, similar to what you're describing with an earthquake taking out half your wind farm, you can have half your power production uh, impacted by that. So there are any number of technologies that are going to need to pay attention to, um, you know, an increasing set of technical risks um, as we continue to try to build out closer to load centers. Um, the good news is most people don't live in earthquake-prone areas unless you're talking about Japan and Taiwan, you know, Vietnam, Cambodia, etc. But, um, you know, you're, you're in um, a space where this is, you know, this DNV project is important because it, it is going to address some... Um, you know, certain technical risks that, that need to be looked at further, uh, and not just for those core markets where earthquakes are a um, larger issue, but it, the, the knowledge can be leveraged elsewhere as well. Well, it's good that DNV's taken the lead on this. Uh, and it, it, I ran into DNV uh, down at one of the ACB events. I think it was in Orlando. Um, yeah, they, they, they got just a lot going on there at DNV right now uh, because the industry is expanding some into places they've never been before. It's like Star Trek, right? <laughs> Where no man has gone before sort of thing. And and yeah, and, and it's getting complicated, right? If you're planting wind turbines in Kansas, you don't really think about earthquakes and all this other stuff. But I guess if you get around Japan and some you know parts of, parts of Asia, you got to pay attention to it. And that's good. Get the latest on wind industry news, business, and technology sent straight to you every week. Sign up for the Uptime Tech Newsletter at weatherguardwind.com slash news. Well, in India, NTPC Renewable Energy Limited, a subsidiary of India's largest power generation company, has announced a tender for nine gigawatt hours of energy storage capacity to be connected to the national grid. The company's renewable energy assets are all owned by the parent company NTPC Limited, which has uh, almost all its power generation projects connected to the national grid infrastructure. The tender condition requires developers to set up at least 100 megawatts of capacity with 600 megawatt hours of storage capacity. Oh, my gosh. Uh, the storage project could be charged with power from NTPC's renewable energy projects and supplied to buyers seeking predictable and stable renewable energy supply, potentially appealing to power distribution utilities across India. So somebody is trying to corner the battery market, the storage market in India. Nine gigawatt hours is huge. Phil, I mean, is that the largest you've ever heard of before? Oh, by far. And and it's interesting because uh, uh, NTPC stands for National Thermal Power Corporation. Um, and they're, you know, they're coming off you know, this whole concept of getting away from coal and natural gas powered base load generation to investing more heavily in renewables. Um, and starting with batteries is a, a great place for them because um, it's going to allow for time shifting and grid smoothing capability to be implemented throughout India, which is something they uh, desperately need if they're going to leverage more 
um, renewable power generation sources. So this is this is a hugely important uh, thing. But as with a lot of things that get announced in India, it doesn't always come to full fruition. Sometimes they only do like 10% of what they say they're going to do. Uh, so just a word of caution, I guess, on that as well. Yeah, it's still a lot, though. I mean, if they did 10% of that. And it is, is this indicative of where some other parts of the world are going to go? Uh, to these large uh, storage projects? Well, I don't think they're doing the whole thing in a single phase. My understanding was that was the total amount that they wanted to deploy across the entire network. But yeah, I don't, I'd also, to that point though, Joel, I don't know if they're going to do everything in like a distributed gen type of, you know, like put a battery every, you know, 600 kilometers in, in you know, their, their grid uh, connection just for, for grid smoothing. Um, you know, but they they could again if they wanted to they they could do a lot of these these types of things. Um, I th get the sense that storage is becoming more important as we run into constraints on grid um, interconnection uh, bottlenecks. Storage becomes more of an important characteristic for the grid to have because. If we can't move the power around, if we don't have the grid infrastructure to be able to accommodate more renewable power sources, we can't move the power around, we don't have effective load balancing, we don't have ancillary services, the battery steps in to take that, uh, to take up some of that needed capability. So I, I think that not only in India, but elsewhere in the world, this is going to become more pervasive. You know, speaking to that, Phil, I just read something today. Now, this was just a headline, right? So don't hold me to the size of it. But I, I read a headline that said Tesla just won a $2.6 billion contract in California to create basically the same thing, to, to create some battery storage on the grid in California to handle those peak loads. Is it kind of the kind of mirror the same thing we're seeing here? Like people are saying, like, okay, we need to have this, especially with more renewables coming online to, like you said, smooth out the the power delivery on the grid. Yeah, and there's actually another uh, huge tender that they want to do in Australia. That you know, because Tesla was kind of a, a big battery, you know, champion and pioneer um, in, I think it was South Australia was the first uh, state that they that they developed a, a big battery in uh, years ago, and so they. They are definitely trying to um, deploy more capacity that's going to allow for, um, again, this uh, grid smoothing has been, based on the, the state of battery technology today, grid smoothing has been the primary focus of a lot of battery technology because you don't have the capability to do efficient long duration storage, at least not yet. But as batteries get better, um, and the battery technology allows for more time shifting of power production versus delivery and demand on the grid. That's also going to um, facilitate much more um, desire for that, that type of long duration storage because the utilities want that capability um, to do price optimal power delivery, whether they're you know, participating in a merchant market or on fixed price contracts. Um, they may still have certain, you know, guarantees that they have to live up to. Um, you know, it, if they are on a merchant power contract, it, you know, or any independent power producer, a battery is going to help you um, ensure that you meet your your obligations so that you don't have to go buy extra power from, you know, some other form of generation that uh, that. Uh, you know, fulfills some commercial obligation that you weren't able to because of, you know, lack of availability of either the resource or the the power generation unit itself. So, yeah, I, there's there's a huge, there's a need for this. There's a, a huge pipeline of projects globally. Um, even in the United States, we've got, you know, I, I want to say something like 300 gigawatt hours um, that are proposed, um, which is a lot, but again, not all of it's going to get built. There's a lot that's in the interconnection queue. A lot of that's in con being done in conjunction with wind and solar projects. Um, so that, again, it sounds like big numbers, but not all of that stuff is going to is gonna end up getting built right away. 
So the point is that the general trend in battery storage technology is that as the technology improves and you get more longer duration storage capability, this will become much more of a pervasive uh, thing to incorporate a lot of storage capacity on the grid for time shifting and not just the grid smoothing. Chinese wind turbine manufacturer Ming Yang Smart Energy has started the construction of a jacket foundation that features a, a net cage system for fish farming, which will be installed at the Ming Yang Quiz How 4 offshore wind farm in the South China Sea later this year. And I know I murdered that name. Uh, the jacket is typhoon resistant. And the aquaculture system will have a remote functions such as automated feeding, monitoring, detection, and collection. And that's – collection is interesting. Uh, it'll feature uh, – this wind farm is going to have 25 of the Mingyang 11 megawatt 230 turbines and 18 Mingyang 12 megawatt 242 uh, offshore wind turbines with one of those uh, a floating turbine. Uh, they're saying or they're hoping that the high-quality fish raised by this – uh, fish farm in a jacket system are comparable to wild fish and less impacted by nearshore marine pollution. So as we've seen in Copenhagen, Joel, there's a lot of effort a around aquaculture and wind farms. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but it's like the concept of aquaculture as a fish raising technique is not new, right? That's that's how a lot of the best the best salmon in the world up in Norwegian and waters off of Newfoundland and stuff are raised. Um, so now you're taking the the idea that we're, we're going to put these jackets out anyways. Why not dual use them? Right. It's it's super smart. And then you're you're maintaining you're also maintaining some of the uh, the biodiversity in the area as well. Because like Orsted, when they did the. Um, uh, the coral rejuvenation project down there where they're planting coral on the jackets, kind of this kind of the same concept where you're, you know, you're, you're stewards of the environment while we're, while we're putting something there. Uh, we're also trying to get, get the most out of the, the use of the space. And um, yeah, just like wild fish. I mean, you've got currents and stuff floating through cleaning, cleaning out the thing, the tank or the, the I guess the net, I mean, I can say tank is not a tank. But yeah, I think it's a good idea. So in my head, the process went like this. I'm thinking the circle of life, right? I got these fish contained in this vessel. Uh, the next thing I'm going to have is seals. We know that the fish are there. And once the seals get there, you know what's next is sharks. So now, now I got shark infested water around these wind turbines because of all the fish and the seals that are hanging around. So it just, and then, you know, next is Godzilla, right? So, in, you, you know, you just go down this real cycle of, of terror uh, just because you put some fish in a jacket. So I'm not sure that we're going to see this in the United States. Uh, I, I wonder if it's going to carry over. Obviously, uh, companies like Orsted that are paying attention will be watching these projects to see how it goes because there's a huge concern all the way up along the East Coast, up through Maine even – about the fisheries and what are we going to do? So I'll give you, I'll give you a, an example or an idea here. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day in my little hometown of, uh, in Wisconsin. They're saying, hey, some of these like Airbnbs are ruining the, the small town resorts. And it's like, okay, well, Airbnbs are going to be a reality. Airbnbs and VRBOs are going to be a reality. And your resort that, you, that hasn't been changed to the idea of how you run it or, or market it or anything has never been changed, if you don't adapt, you'll get kind of run over. Right. That, that, that's, how business, that's how business works in a capitalistic society. So these f uh, fish farmers that are on – this isn't necessarily the same, but kind of the same idea as these fish – the fishing, fishing industry on the east coast of the U.S. saying, hey, what about us? What about us? Well, why don't you – why, why not adapt? Uh, instead of fighting against the, the wind farms that are coming in, why don't you – hey, let's, let's farm fish within the jackets. We can create this system. We'll, we'll maintain and monitor it because we're the, we're the fish experts. And we'll both benefit off of the, this development. So I, I think that I would like to see that happen, right? I think that there's, I know for a fact, there's a lot of this kind of commercial fishing in nets that goes on like this up in Alaska. Um, uh, I'm not, I, I have never seen the markets and things off the coast of Maine and Massachusetts and that corner of the world, but I would imagine there's some out there as well. I know there's a bunch offshore Canada and Norway um, and the UK even. So I say, why not? So this gets into something we saw in Denmark at the uh, Wind Europe show, which is the Eco Concrete. I'm going to mispronounce this because it's spelled it's spelled E Concrete, but I think they pronounce it E, e Echo Concrete, something like that, or Echo Crete, where it's a special concrete mix that attracts fish and algae and sea life. 
right? There's a, there is a big push at the moment in the industry to attract more sea life to be around the wind turbines. And I thought initially, like a block island, that they were not trying to like have sea creatures around it necessarily on the turbines. But it does feel like there's been a, sh a shift because of the pushback from the fisheries that, hey, um, having more sea life around there that, that could be farmed is a good thing. Yeah. I mean, naturally, if you're a fisherman at all, you, you fish around structure. Go off of the Gulf Coast. If you go off the Gulf Coast out of, say, Galveston, where they're planning a few auctions for offshore wind, go motor a boat out to those uh, all those offshore oil and gas platforms on a weekend. That's where all of the fishing boats are. They're surrounding all those jackets that those platforms are on because that's where all the good fishing is. If we start building all these wind farms offshore, we're going to induce fish to show up there and sea life to show up there. Can you farm those things because they're so close to the wind turbines? Is is, is there going to be this like this plethora of nice, rich fish pile that now and crab pile and whatever else that is off limits? <laughs> is that what happens? Yeah. I'm sure there's an exclusion zone around these turbines that people would want to see. So you can't, you're not dragging your nets along them. So if for commercial fishing, the, you know, to get right up next to them, I don't think is really viable or safe uh, in my mind. Maybe people are, but I would also would hate to be the person dragging my nets along the side of a <laughs> wind turbine jacket and get caught. Um, so I think that the proper solution here or the or a good solution is to integrate the, you know, some actual commercial fishing, um, and commercial fishing aquaculture farms, uh, offshore, uh, to, to do this. So is it only rod and reel, you know, the turbines, is that where it's going to go? Like to do that tuna fishing on the East coast? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Cause then if you get caught, you can just cut your line. Right. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking too. Oh man, I got a cable. Just, just don't cast, don't cast too high. Because if you cast too high, you might get hooked on the blade. You don't want to do that. <laughs> that would be there. Whoop, there goes your rod. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Let it go. Let it go. Right. Keep in mind one other thing too with with this Ming Yang project. The reason that Ming Yang is instigating this is because where they're deploying a lot of offshore turbines in China, especially, it's extremely shallow water. Um, where a significant amount of commercial fishing occurs, um, and they they need to have a solution because uh, more so than in the east coast of the U.S. or or places throughout Europe, um, the Chinese fishermen and women are being displaced by these offshore wind farms. Um, you're just not hearing as much. They're not vociferous about it uh, because obviously in China they're gonna you know censor anything that that would be adverse to um you know adverse to what they they the the image that they want to project i guess is is the best way to say it but uh you know they're they're trying to come up with viable solutions to uh, an increasing issue and to the extent that the technology could be leveraged elsewhere in the world i think it is you know i'll agree that that it's a good idea it's a good thing down in Spain, Nabra Wind, uh, the Spanish wind turbine technology company, has secured funding uh, support from Fortescue F Future Industries, a green uh, energy and products company, to expand its production ca capacity to meet growing demand from renewable projects in the coming years. Now, th this is important, right, because Nabra Wind has been doing a number of new concept, new ideas, bringing them to market. Um, so the funding agreement, which is – Convertible into a minority sh shareholding uh, aims to reduce the cost of renewable energy production by supporting Napa Wind's innovative products, including the modular blade, self-directing tower, the tripod foundation, the craneless blade installation system, and a new system to install the whole wind turbine. Uh, Napa Wind's strategic plan includes both organic and inorganic growth by key alliances uh, or joint ventures with other stakeholders all over the world. And we have seen some of that with some Chinese uh, companies. So uh, this is interesting. So I think over in Copenhagen, there was a lot of discussion about investment in renewable energy companies. A lot of, a lot of businesses looking for funding. There was a lot of VC firms on the floor. Uh, shopping around, seeing what was out there that they could invest in. They know that wind energy is going to be a huge marketplace. So there is money available, weirdly enough, uh, as the sort of the VC community collapses in the United States on the high-tech world, uh, on the software world. 
in wind, there are still players in Neverwind, which is developing so many different kinds of technologies at the same time, must need cash to develop them. Well, here we go. Uh, they're finding a partner to go do that. Phil, is this uh, indicative of what will happen over the next year, two or three? Yeah, it's it's great to actually see that you know companies that have innovative concepts can can actually go get some funding because even going back a few years ago, that wasn't necessarily the case. You know, like you mentioned, a lot of VCs were were adverse to doing, especially like a hardware play in. Uh, the renewable energy sector, you know, they, if you had software, you know, anything to do with asset performance enhancement, you could get funding, but hardware plays were, were a hard sell. Nowadays, it's, it's a lot more open. Um, and that's good for companies like Neverwind that have, you know, a, a viable technology uh, that, that, serves a, a a few different needs you know then it, obviously they have a few different technologies and and you know they're, they're basically that's trying to make things easier faster better um the question is you know is this going to help facilitate prototypes and the development uh, and mat maturity of the technology to a point where it becomes commercially viable because at this point what they have you know, it's one of these kind of situations where it's going to work technologically, but can they make it work commercially with enough volume that justifies, you know, changing over transportation and logistics fixtures, changing the way we do um, installation and erection, retraining a lot of people that have experience with cranes and the fixtures and, you know, the, the kind of the industry standard way that it's done today. Um, so there's, there's a lot of ancillary things that need to happen in order for a new technology like self-erecting towers, um, self-installing nacelles, um, you know, uh, craneless, um, you know, blade exchange systems, things like that. It's that there's a lot that needs to happen for those technologies to become commercially viable, even if they're already technologically proven. I, that's the one thing that kind of concerns me here. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I, I really applaud Nabrawind moving forward, coming up with a bunch of solutions. We've got all these ideas. We're going to change the way things work or try to help and, and do our part for the energy transition. I applaud that. However, I, I have personal experience in being involved in, in groups where... Uh, let me let me give you an idea here. If you're in the U.S. and you've ever went uh, or know someone that has gone duck hunting... Okay, so ducks come in as a flock and there's going to be 5, 10, 15, 20 of them. And if you're hunting, you're sitting in your, in your ground blind and everybody goes, all right, let's shoot some ducks. And you go up to shoot the ducks. If you just look at that flock and you got 5, 10, 15, 20 of them and you start shooting in them, not one of them is going to fall. You won't harvest one of those ducks. You're not going to be successful. But if you pick out one of them and you focus on that one, you got a better chance of knocking it down. So my worry here from a PE standpoint, private equity or or the VC standpoint of investing in Nabrawind is while they, they may be a big company, they got a lot of ideas. Do you have the processes and the, the gumption in place to see one of these things through from TRL, you know, technology ready in this level one to technology ready level nine? Do you have that? Is that in place or will you get lost in the focus of all the shiny glitter that you've got going on in this company? That's that would be my worry. Hey, Uptime listeners, we know how difficult it is to keep track of the wind industry. That's why we read PES Wind magazine. PES Wind doesn't summarize the news. It digs into the tough issues and PES Wind is written by the experts so you can get the in-depth info you need. Check out the wind industry's leading trade publication, PES Wind at PESWind.com. All right, RWE, a, a leading German energy company, which we all uh, know and love, has signed a framework agreement with Siemens Gamesa, also a company we all know well, uh, uh, which you know Siemens Gamesa is really starting to crank up here. Uh, and so RWE and Siemens Gamesa are just signed an agreement for 1,000 megawatts uh, to buy turbines through 2027. Holy moly. Under the agreement, Siemens Gamesa will become the leading supplier of large components for RWE's project pipeline. Uh, RWE will mainly procure the Siemens Gamesa uh, 5X onshore platform, which is one that's had a little bit of issues, but it sounds like they've worked through them. 
uh, with a flexible rated output up to 6.6 .6 and, and maybe up to 7 megawatts, as well as uh, they're going to buy several Siemens Gamesa 4X uh, turbines. Uh, the partnership will enable RWE to carry out maintenance and inspection on its own through a service agreement for the wind turbines. And the two companies have a long, obviously, have a long-standing partnership in the onshore and offshore sector, with uh, RDB selecting Siemens Gamesa as the preferred supplier for its uh, one gigawatt Thor wind farm in the Danish North Sea earlier this year. Uh, RDB is also using recyclable rotor blades from Siemens Gamesa for its German offshore wind farm Kaskasi and its largest construction project Sophia. So there is a really close relationship, and rightly so, right? In Europe, it makes sense to hook up with, you know, Abestas and Siemens Gamesa, and RWE has clearly shown Siemens Gamesa as a wind terminal of choice here, which is a huge deal for Siemens Gamesa. Yeah, if I was any anybody that has the the clout or the pull like RWE is, I would be doing the exact same thing with my OEM of choice, simply because, like like we just like we have been talking about the IRA bill shooting up. That's going to be who can make the turbines the fastest. And if you've got an agreement signed, you should be in the front of the line. Same thing in the EU because it was it. Was it, um, uh, I don't remember if it was a Macron or someone came and said like, hey, the IRA bill is kind of short sheeting us because now we're not going to get turbines because the U.S. is putting so many orders. And RWE said, you know what, we're going to we're going to pull up our, 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 our big boy, big girl pants and we're going to just go and sign an agreement that says we get them. Um, I would do. I think it's a great move by both of them. You know, the same thing is happening between GE and NextEra, right, Phil? So I, I don't know if you saw that. YouTube video the other day between NextEra and GE. I thought, man, everybody is building this huge relationship, this in this direct pipeline to an OEM. Yeah, and it, what's interesting, so the couple of things on the RWE uh, Siemens Gamesa deal. So one is that RWE is actually going to leverage the OEM long-term service agreement to um, help maintain the assets, which is interesting because uh, traditionally RWE, you know, and previously Eon, et cetera, um, you know, had had been uh, doing a lot of self-performance of maintenance um, or partnering with independent service providers. So this is a bit of a, I mean, they, they certainly leverage the OEMs already, but for such a, a deal of such a size, you know, one gigawatt on these, you know, five plus megawatt platforms um, to have the OEM long-term service contract in place is, uh, is also interesting to, to note. The other thing that you kind of touched on, Alan, which I, I um, kind of am, am curious about is, you know, not all the teething issues on this five, six, seven megawatt uh, Siemens Gamesa platform are actually worked out yet. So it's a pretty big thing for RWE to actually um, make this type of a commitment. Uh, although I, th I will agree with Joel that the, it, the, the largest driving factor is um, probably like let's get a frame agreement in place so that we can at least secure a certain amount of order book should we choose to avail ourselves of you know making firm orders up to a gigawatt in in size one of the things that's interesting about this one alan you and i have talked about it in the background a little bit at some point in time there may be a day when one of these oems is either partially purchased or purchased by a large asset owner, uh, asset operator. R RWE is a big one. Nextera is a big one. You got Orsted out there. You got the, the Iberdrola family out there. So it, it was, do you think, and, and this is pure speculation, right? But do you think that some of this might be like, hey, let's see how we play well together with Nextera and GE. Let's, let's see if we like each other or not. I love that idea, but industry hates it. I, I've talked to, to people in the industry. It's like there is no way a Siemens Gamesa is ever going to hook up with an operator. No chance. And I, I and it's the example they give me. They, they give me an aerospace example because that's where my background is. Like Boeing has never connected with an airline. Like Boeing never ran an airline. Airbus doesn't run airlines. So so why would GE uh, and, uh, and Next Era combine? They're just not going to do that because they feel like they're going to lose market share because they're competing against their other customers, which I kind of get. But there's going to be a huge consolidation in this in this marketplace over the next two to five years. There has to be because the OEMs are losing too much money and the operators are making money. So somewhere they have to connect, right? No, I, I do. I hate the idea, but I, I will also point out that where do you think, you know, United and United Technologies came from? They were initially the same company and then they split the airline operator versus the, the you know, equipment fabricator. 
So, you know, to that point, I mean, and obviously that occurred, you know, almost 100 years ago at this point, but, you know, this, this is why the industry hates it is they don't, the the more vertical integration that you have for any one single company you're you're almost getting yourself back into a too big to fail type of a situation and you know inevitably there's going to be some black swan event well but the, eventually something will happen in the future that will cause some type of a, an issue and you know it, it's gonna it's gonna cause chaos let's uh, let, 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 let me, let, let's, let's let's go down that pathway because i think you raised a very good point the, the too big to fail scenario right so right now in the united states we have four banks that are too big to fail because the united states deem them too big to fail now if if the administration the current administration believes that it, it ge can ge for nova cannot go away what do you think they're going to do the government, the government will always. I mean, especially for a company like GE that's been around forever. Um, but even in in Europe, you know, you you will have a scenario where you know somebody will step in and say like Vestas is too big to fail, uh, or you know. But I, I think this whole profitability challenge that's currently being faced in the market will eventually stabilize when two things happen. First of all, if the if governments will provide more commitment for projects um, and future project pipeline, that'll get a lot of the OEMs and subcomponent suppliers to invest more, or at least seek, uh, you know, funding to invest in additional manufacturing capacity. That additional manufacturing capacity is going to open up a lot more of the roadblocks that you currently see with. Um, you know, component availability and, you know, that's why prices are kind of spiking, um, you know, for, for turbines and things like that. So I'll, I think a lot of that is an issue that does need to be addressed, but it's a shorter term issue that will eventually, you know, kind of recede into the background and, and the, the bigger issue of everybody's making money will, you know, need to be addressed vis-a-vis -vis like, all right, if... Oil is at eighty, ninety, a hundred dollars a barrel, and you know renewable energy PPAs are only like thirty-five or forty dollars. Then why am I spending my money in renewable energy when I could be making more money in oil and gas? And I think there's two ways to address that: either commercially or through a regulatory requirement. And the more regulatory requirement that can be put in place that says you shall invest in renewables, it's going to you know, provide more capital flow, and that's necessarily going to do things like elevate prices to the point where everybody can get back to making money. You know, a lot of the analysis we've even done lately shows that the profitability of, of projects went way down when PPAs started going through the floor. And that's why a lot of companies, even though there's a huge interconnection queue in the United States, in Europe, in Asia, um, you know, Australia and, and other places, you, you're still talking about a scenario where companies are making a choice not to sign, you know, a 10, 11, $12 a megawatt hour PPA anymore, whereas three, four years ago, they were just to get steel in the ground and start collecting, you know, whether it's feed and tariff revenue, PTC revenue, whatever, um, in addition to what they would get from a PPA. So again, I think, you know, the, the, going back to our original premise here, this, you know, a, a, a utility company getting together with an OEM and doing the vertical integration, it, it's something that it, to a certain degree makes sense, but you don't need to vertically integrate if you can just guarantee a certain amount of order book. The utility is in a much better position to guarantee a certain amount of order book for an OEM if the utility and the OEM go to the government and say, you know, put a stable, you know, policy regime in place and we can all make money and we can all just get on with our, you know, get on with our business. Uh, I mean, when's the last time you ever saw a government get, of, get out of its own way and, and allow an industry to flourish? I mean, it, it doesn't always happen that way. So, you know, that's what we're all hoping for as an industry. Okay. So, so Phil's analysis and I, and, You've explained to this to me a couple of times, and it takes a couple of times for me to absorb all this stuff, Phil. You know, I'm, I'm not a quick learner. But what Phil is saying is essentially we, they need a pipeline 
the factory needs to run all the time. Our, the Siemens Camesa factory needs to be pumping out wind turbines all the time, and they need to have a, a, a calendar full of shipments. That's their dream, but they're only going to get there, Phil, if they have big operators that are going to play ball with them, like RWE. And you, I think you saw that in the California auction where some of these people, I think it was like 30 or 40 companies that were going to bid in those California offshore auctions. And it ended up being like five or six because it couldn't make a deal with that, with that OEM. I, I assume that was the big problem that the OEMs are picking the RWEs, the Equinors, the Orsteds of the world because of the pipeline problem, which you've nailed. California was a special situation because, I mean, even just this morning, by the way, they the CAISO just announced that they're pushing back. Um, by another two or three years, the offshore wind transmission infrastructure, uh, the regulations and the, the commencement of the projects, which means you're not going to see steel in the water or floating in the water in California until 2032, maybe, if you're lucky. So it's going to be at least nine, 10 years from now. So addressing that pipeline problem right from the government that you're talking about, like, hey, the factories need to run all these things. So if we do a root cause analysis and kind of d dive backwards on that thing, the problem here is regulation, permitting, siting, getting these, the, getting the approvals and permits to interconnect and get these things in the ground. Because a lot of, I know that the queues are so long that they're there ready to go. Like, hey, we could have these factories running, but we can't get this stuff. We can't get the permits in place. So you just said California delayed another, I mean, it's 10 years from now almost. Right. I know in like in MISO, there's a huge queue. There's there's gigawatts in the queue in almost every uh, interconnector, any every every uh, power generation facility or um, area in, in the country. So the problem here is that we need to get our regulators to either put more resources to permitting or not. I'm not necessarily saying easing the permit restrictions, but at least get some more resources there so that these things can get pushed through. Because if those can get pushed through, then the entire industry can start installing and moving. Yes, and and Joel, that's exactly to the point of if before, you know, if you look back at like three four years, um, what was happening before is companies were still sitting in an interconnection queue, although much shorter than it even even is today. But what they were doing is they were saying, all right, we want to jump the queue. We want to start collecting PTC revenue or other feed and tariff revenue that we can get. And in order to jump the queue, you can get a power marketing firm to give you a $10, $11, $12 $11 megawatt hour PPA that at least gets you some kind of an offtake. Because otherwise you have to wait to get a you know, free space, so to speak, in the merchant power market where they're only going to allow a certain amount of capacity to be added because they don't want to flood the market, it'll depress prices. Or you have to get a utility or corporate power offtake agreement, which are becoming fewer and further between because, you know, in some cases, demand hasn't grown enough to, to warrant uh, the, such a significant amount of new capacity. So if you don't have coal and natural gas power retirements, and you're not willing to sign PPAs at 12 bucks a megawatt hour or less, then you're going to have a huge interconnection queue. So that's the only other way to resolve that is um, either you you compromise the profitability of your project, which everybody doesn't want to do anymore because they all recognize the the fallacy of uh, and the flawed logic behind taking a, a $12 a megawatt hour PPA deal. Um, they're now going to sit around and wait in this interconnection queue until they can get a, a $35, $40, $50 $50 megawatt hour PPA again. So that just means the, the backup is there. So Phil and I have talked about putting together a special episode about the interconnect problem because the Department of Energy put out some studies about it, and it is a huge problem, Joel, that the, getting – Green energy on the grid is a major stumbling block. We can plant all the wind turbines we want into the ground. Hooking up to the grid is the biggest problem of all. And it sounds like California is is in the midst of that right now. So we, we need to come back, Phil, and talk about that for sure. That's it, because we talked a couple months ago about a $10 billion expansion project for MISO for their transmission lines. But that was a part of it, right? we got to get this going so we can get these things on board. Yeah, Yeah, we need to dive into that. Let's do it. Our farm of the week is High Banks Wind. And they are located in Washington and Republic counties in Kansas, near the Kansas-Nebraska border. You ever been to Marysville, Kansas, like I have, you know where this is. The first turbine has been installed on the site. That's good news, right? 
Uh, so it's a next era energy project that will have a capacity around 600 megawatts of clean renewable energy. Uh, next era has selected GE 2.5 megawatt machines. There are going to be 233 of them on the site. And Joel, that means they're going to have to have one of those fancy radar systems for the lights. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's coming. Uh, Next Era estimates uh, $149 million in payments to the landowners and $224 million in tax revenue to the local communities over the 30-year life of the project. Wow. That's a game changer. That's a game changer for that part of Kansas and Nebraska. Uh, congratulations. That's fantastic. So congratulations to High Banks Wind. You are our wind farm of the week. That's going to do it for this week's Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. Thanks for listening. Please give us a five-star rating on your podcast platform and subscribe in the show notes below to Uptime Tech News, our weekly newsletter. And check out Rosemary's YouTube channel, Engineering with Rosie. And we'll see you here next week on the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. Thank you.